yeah, shaping a life, self-expression, broadly defined. You know, that to me is, is the point. That's what we're doing here. If we take seriously the scriptural statement, God created man in his own image, or the hermetic mm -hmm. statement, um, as above, so below, which in many ways are at the foundation of the whole Abrahamic religious culture, then it seems to me that the individual's capacity to create, broadly defined, mm. um, <clears throat> is innate to what we're aiming to accomplish with these, these lives. It's what we're given. And the deterrence of self-expression, I think, causes people terrible anguish. <laughs> Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I am joined by historian, author, and voice of the esoteric, Mitch Horowitz, to discuss his most recent publication, Uncertain Places, Essays on Occult and Outsider Experiences. Among many other topics, Mitch and I discuss the philosophical implications of New Age thought, its metaphysics, its epistemologies, ethics, and theodicy. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. Mitch Horowitz is a Penn Award-winning historian and widely known voice of esoteric ideas with bylines in the New York Times, Time, Politico, Salon, and the Wall Street Journal, and media appearances on Dateline NBC, CBS Sunday Morning, All Things Considered, and Coast to Coast AM. He is the author of many books, including Occult America, One Simple Idea, Daydream Believer, and The Miracle Club. He joins me today to discuss his latest book, Uncertain Places, Essays on Occult and Outsider Experiences. Mitch, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you, man. Good to be here. Yeah, thank you. I am uh, so appreciative of your time today. Um, you. And I, I have to admit, I'm a little bit at a loss on where to begin because I want to talk to you about so many things. <laughs> Anything. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, well, I'm going to do my best to kind of constrain myself. Um, and I thought that I'd focus on some of the themes that I think run through the essays in uncertain places. Mm -hmm. um, and I really enjoyed the book, by the way. Thank I, you. I really appreciated having a collection of these ideas and essays. Um, uh, but first, I wanted to ask you about the title, uh, because I find that really provocative. And in the introduction or reintroduction, as you call it, mm -hmm. you wrote that to write on metaphysical themes is to live in a state of constant uncertainty, or at least it ought to be. Why? Well, we have evidence both in our own experiences and from more traditional sources, such as through the academic study of ESP and other fields for extra physicality. Mm -hmm. And yet we do not have an understanding of causes. And we in Western culture, um, we like to gather evidence and we like to understand cause. And we have one without the other. And that's a situation that requires us to sustain uncertainty, unless we're just going to flip the chessboard over and reject the evidence, which mm. many people have elected to do, uh, sometimes passively, sometimes actively. But the fact is, we are in a situation uh, on our knees staring through a keyhole and we mm. understand some of what's going on through that keyhole but there's so little that we really do see and we have almost no peripheral vision uh, beyond what we're observing through that keyhole so people will routinely talk about near-death experiences out-of-body experiences clairvoyant experiences and these things are not just limited to the domain of testimony although I take testimony very seriously. We really have from both within the hard sciences and within the science of parapsychology on an academic level, gathered absolutely persuasive, replicable, and bulletproof evidence uh, going back almost 100 years that uh, testifies to the perceptual basis of reality, or at least the extent to which perception contributes 
concretely to reality, not just in terms of one's cognitive prejudices, but in an actual way, such as what we experience in the placebo response or mm. uh, neuroplasticity demonstrates to us that uh, the brain itself actually undergoes biologic changes based on the nature of sustained thoughts, uh, just to cite two uh, reasonably elementary examples. And yet we don't have, I speak of causation, of course, yeah. but here yeah. in Western civilization, very frequently what we call causation amounts to a theory. Mm. Uh, and a theory is really just one more concept of reality, not reality itself. But it must be said, we don't have a theory um, mm. of ESP, for example, of precognition, even though, as I write in Uncertain Places, Daydream Believer and elsewhere, we've amassed extraordinary and replicable evidence for both of these things. And uh, so if one is unwilling to embrace uncertainty, then you either just become uh, kind of credulous and 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 shape a new orthodoxy where we decide that uh, I have a perfectly good understanding of the metaphysics of life, or we we avert our gaze uh, from the evidence, neither of which I think is a really satisfying place. So uncertainty may be the most satisfying place to be. Yeah, I appreciate that so much. Uh, something I've said several times on the podcast is that we really need to learn to surf the waves of uncertainty um, yep. because it seems to me that it's when there are claims to certainty that that's when all sorts of problems start arising. Yeah. And it blinds us. And it, it's very, our claims to certainty are very often just emotional. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to know what's going on in the world and yeah. we cleave to these emotional positions and start to debate them to the point where the facts themselves become distantly secondary and the emotion of winning becomes primary, which is, of course, what fuels most debates on social media. Yeah, for sure. Well, and this is one of the threads that I kind of want to follow here. I've got, I don't want to say I have an agenda, but I have a little bit of um, a, what, someplace I want to get us to, I think, um, because you are a, I think, a representative um, of what's usually referred to as the new age or mm -hmm. new age movement. Mm -hmm. And you embrace that. And there are some things that you've written uh, and that I want to get to. So for example, one, you say that uh, there needs to be, especially with the new thought, a theology of suffering. And as I was reading, I was also picking out some of these other things like, well, not only do we need that, but we need like an epistemology for these things. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a metaphysics. Um, and I kind of want to dig into some of these things with you. Um, that's sort of my hidden agenda. Um, so let me start um, by focusing on this new age. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, how, what do you understand the new age to be? Um, because you do have a essay where uh, it's the new age and Gnosticism. So you're mm -hmm. making a kind of comparison, a comparison, comparison, excuse me. Uh, and when I hear Gnostic, I automatically think Gnosis, knowledge, which seems to be antithetical to uncertainty. Mm. Well, I think that knowledge is open-ended. Uh, knowledge doesn't have to imply a closed circuit. Uh, it can be an awareness of something, a realization of something, an acknowledgement of something, mm. all of which can serve to deepen one's questions. So nothing about the gathering of knowledge um, should divert us from the ability to sustain a question. In mm. fact, I would say nowadays, we as a human community have gotten much better at measuring things. There's all kinds of things that we can measure right. on the cosmic as well as the particulate scale. And the more we the more we know, the less we know. The more information we gather, the greater the questions that we face. I define New Age as a radically ecumenical culture of therapeutic spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I'm very aware that most people, particularly from within mainstream letters, use the term new age as an epithet, as an insult. Right, right. Uh, it's used to uh, connote everything that's fuzzy, trendy, squishy, unserious um, in the cultures of spirituality and maybe wellness. 
And I dissent from that because while, of course, one can find those traits almost with any, within any uh, human subculture, um, including many reaches of academia itself, uh, I try to use new age in a way that has historical integrity. The term mm -hmm. emerged in the 1970s for people who were pursuing new avenues of spirituality, alternative health, new lifestyles. And not only do I embrace the term for those reasons, but the simple fact is I'm not a very big advocate of changing vocabulary. Uh, a lot of people have said to me, I was just speaking to some lovely people at an ESP conference uh, in London this past weekend. And some people said, look, you know, maybe it's time to get away from some of the old language. Maybe we need to say noetics rather than mm -hmm. ESP or parapsychology. And look, the individual or a given organization can do as it wishes. But my contention is that changing vocabulary very rarely does much good. Mm -hmm. I realized early on in my career that I was going to get called new age no matter what I did. Mm -hmm. So rather than fleeing from the label as an insult, I thought, well, why not just embrace it? Because I do believe in its historical integrity. And as soon as that occurred, I felt much more relaxed. You know, I could mm -hmm. walk into a room and not have to worry that I was going to be called this, this name, but rather apply it to myself because mm -hmm. I'm not uh, I, I, I'm not in any way at odds with the goal, most goals of the new age culture, although there are aspects of that culture that are childish, that are immature. And again, I could point out aspects of any subculture uh, right. that, that suffers from those maladies. But historically, I'm, uh, I want to preserve it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that as well, um, because I know that new age, and this is something I've struggled with, um, you know, it's all too often derided as being, you know, woo or yep. woo woo. And I hate that. I hate that language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's meant to invalidate. You know. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I also think that you've got a really good point that you make that it seems to be missing something in the sense that, you know, you wrote that, you know, it hasn't produced a lot of scholars um, yep. or journalists or public voices. And I, I'm curious, why do you think that is? I've wrestled with that because one of the things I've noticed is that there are other new religious movements that have produced just outstanding scholars. Uh, that's true of Mormonism. That's true of Christian science. And I wonder why so few really great scholars have come out of, say, the new thought culture or the mind causation culture associated with law of attraction and some things. Mm -hmm. And one can extrapolate more broadly from that and say, well, the um, the new age culture. And I suppose that, of course, the cynic would say, well, because, you know, it's a dumb subculture and dumb subcultures don't produce good scholars. But uh, again, I could point to any number of movements that um, a cynic might have problems with. I've mentioned two. Another is Seventh-day Adventism, another new religious movement. And, and that movement has also produced some very fine scholars. Um, I think probably um, it, it reflects a positive and a negative aspect of new age development. The positive aspect is that a lot of people are there because they're fleeing from uh, conformity and hierarchies mm -hmm. in, in outer life. So that tends to attract outsiders. But there is a more negative side to that, which I won't flinch from acknowledging. And that is that I think new age culture has also become an unfortunate attractor for people who are also fleeing uh, maybe the quotidian demands of outer life, mm -hmm. maintaining a household, maintaining a job, maintaining relationships, watering mm -hmm. your house plants and things of mm -hmm. this nature. And, and I do find that there is an outsized fraction of people within the new age culture who are there because they are using the excuse of uh, non-attachment, uh, non-identification, going with the flow, seeking the higher as an exit ramp from mm -hmm. some of the demands that outer life places on us. And that's where you do start to get into some of these problematic areas where new age develops a reputation for flakiness. Um, since I freely acknowledge myself 
as a confederate of new age i feel that i've i'm entitled to um critique my own house mm -hmm. and within my own house there is flakiness absolutely mm -hmm. true and that concerns me that concerns mm -hmm. me the spiritual search is supposed to deepen our understanding of reality not substitute for our ability to function in outer function well in outer life yeah well it seems to me that so many other traditions also suffer from that you know, I think that one of the criticisms I've often heard about the New Age movement is it leads to a sort of narcissism. Um, but, I, you know, I find a lot of my Christian friends to be incredibly narcissistic. Yeah. Um, so I don't think there's anything inherent with the New Age that leads to that. I agree. And I think it's strictly human nature. It's strictly yeah. human nature. You could go to any subculture anywhere and find people who are using pretty language to perfume bad motives or selfish mm. motives or however you want to put it. Yeah. Um, it's also why I get I get a little suspicious of 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 sweet and syrupy <laughs> language. You know, yeah. I was having a podcast with a dear friend of mine, Chet Czar, who's a wonderful mm. artist, and Chet was asking me whether I felt that within my work or my efforts, there was a quality of service. And mm. service is one of those words to which I have an allergy because mm. I've I've personally found, and I've been doing this a long time, that people who tend to be the first ones in the room to use the word service are also the ones who've got a shiv just right behind their back <laughs> that they'll poke yeah. in the ribs with as soon as mm. you, you know, turn around. And so <clears throat> I want to be really careful that we don't use language to perfume ourselves. Right, right. And just a shout out to Chet Czar. He's an amazing person. Isn't he amazing? Um, yeah. Great artist, yeah. great person. I love yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do I. Uh, I finally got the opportunity <clears throat> to speak with him. We've been sort of circling around each other's orbits. We have a mutual friend. Mm -hmm. um, and the mutual friend finally said, enough is enough. You guys need to talk. <laughs> right, right. So He's uh, wonderful. Meeting him has been yeah. one of the great developments in, my, developments in my life over the past few months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would agree. I would say the friend. same thing, actually. Um, hopefully, I can consider him a friend. Um, I, I know he'll be listening to this. So uh, chat, you rock. Um, but to get back to the conversation, one of the things that I personally kind of struggle with is how exactly do we separate the wheat from the chaff? Um, and this gets into my thinking in terms of like an epistemology, mm -hmm. you know, because there is some flakiness, you know, how do we constrain? Do we constrain? What, what's the path forward? Um, in terms of, I, I guess, not falling into believing things that are totally absurd or even detrimental. Yeah. Well, those are issues. Uh, a, a conspiracy culture has encroached upon the perimeters of the new age. There is a not insubstantial fraction of people within the new age who indulge in conspiracies. I yeah. define conspiracies very simply as yeah. man's perpetual hunt for a hidden foe. And yeah. that hunt almost always ends in very familiar places and very dreary and depressing places. And it's this constant idea that I'm the good guy and there's a hidden hand out there that's the bad guy. And I will identify that bad guy using certain tried and true mm -hmm. Uh, phrases and scent trails and usually the the identification comes up sounding a lot like the language that have fueled some of the ugliest prejudices that have beset humanity for hundreds and hundreds of years so there's that issue at the same time when one is talking about kind of garden variety flakiness or weirdness not something that goes in a ugly or prejudicial direction or something um, there is a degree of tolerance that's needed because yeah, yeah. the new age has also been a springboard for a lot of very innovative ideas within mm -hmm. our culture. And sometimes when you're on the margins, you do have to have a tolerance for certain marginal behaviors. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, if you look at so many things in this country uh, that have enriched people's lives, everything from 
uh, Zen to yoga to meditation to macrobiotic eating to uh, uh, different facets of the recovery movement and so on. A lot of these things really did get their start um, or at least in part got their start or or found their way to popularity by way of the so-called new age uh, as a kind of entry point engine springboard. So for example, I practice transcendental meditation. I view TM as a wonderful, wonderful technique that I'm uh, I think there that has clearly helped a lot of people from different backgrounds and 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 with different life needs. Now, um, when the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi first came to America in 1959 and began to teach transcendental meditation, the people at that time that were able to receive the Maharishi, get it, understand what he was about, were to a very large extent people who were part of the alternative spiritual scene. Later, the Maharishi became much broader and bigger than that. And by the time he was hanging around with the Beatles and the Beach Boys and so forth, the, Mahar <clears throat> the Maharishi was bigger than any particular subculture or movement. But when he first got here and Americans had to receive him, well, you know, the Americans who received him were not the Rotary Club or the JCs or the 4-H Society, no aspersion on any, any of those groups. Mm -hmm. But they were folks who probably had come out of um, movements in theosophy, early movements in yoga, who were probably part of different occult and esoter esoteric subcultures. The term New Age didn't really exist yet and wouldn't popularly for at least another 20 years. But they were able to say, oh, I get it. You know, this is a guru from India and he's a monk and he has a Vedic technique that he wants to teach us. It had to start somewhere. So mm -hmm. I think one also needs to develop a certain toleration for realizing that there's going to be some eccentric behavior if you want to be on the margins and you also want to have the benefit of being around when new stuff is uh, coming down the pike. Yeah. Well, I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, the connection with the Gnosticism is it's syncretic, right? It's a syncretic movement. And, and I think that sometimes it may be not recognized that new age actually the ideas are pretty old i think it's probably fair to say almost 200 years old now and to some extent oh, sure. you know you going know. back to transcendentalists and yes i agree i agree and you know new age is criticized for being cafeteria religion uh right. it's it's uh adherents are and very few people define themselves as new age per se but mm -hmm. let's say loosely speaking it's adherents might pick among different practices. For example, I've mentioned one of them, TM is a Vedic mm. practice. Well, I'm not a Hindu, but I do sit in meditation twice a day in a practice that's eminent from Vedism. Does that make me a purveyor of cafeteria religion? Well, I can live with that. Mm. I mean, what's the point of the religious traditions? Is the point to curate a museum or is the point <laughs> to use these things as, as pipelines through which ideas flow that can benefit the individual. So if somebody's interested in Kabbalah and they don't come from a traditional Jewish background, I'm the last person who's going to say, no, 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 sorry. You know, you have to go to a yeshiva. You have to attend a traditional Jewish education. That First of all, that's not going to happen. That's not how contemporary life in the West functions for the most part. And secondly, again, at, at what point are we going to acknowledge that some of our wisdom traditions, some of our religions, in fact, I would say all of them, if they earn the status of posterity, serve as a function through which ideas reach us. Mm. Uh, if a person, you know, right now there's a popular trend in people reading Stoic literature. Well, right. most of the Stoics, you know, came out of a polytheistic Hellenic tradition. Marcus Aurelius worshiped Jupiter. I don't happen to worship Jupiter, although I I have nothing against that as an experiment. Maybe next time we talk, I will have made some inroads in that direction. But you can what I'm really trying to say is, you know, you can read Marcus Aurelius and 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 not see yourself in any way 
as connected to Hellenic polytheism. In fact, it wouldn't even cross the individual's mind, right. literally. But that was the intellectual background in which Marcus was schooled and where he came out of. What he did was an extraordinary act of human insight. But that was the that was the background system. That was the ecosystem from which he, as a young man and a former academician being groomed for royal leadership in Rome, emerged. So much time has passed that we no longer think in those terms. Um, in fact, Stoicism is viewed as a philosophy of great utility, great practicality. People are proud, as they should be, to declare their interest in it. Um, there's no compromise there, and I think there's no compromise in using ideas from other religious traditions if they improve the conduct and the experience of the seeker. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's this tendency <clears throat> that people think of religions as these monolithic things and it's like hands off and we can't do that. None of them are these monolithic things. There's always this incredible amount of diversity uh, within them. But at some times, I think that, and we're seeing this now in the United States and maybe other points in the world where the quote, traditional religions, people are just running away from them. Um, the fastest growing demographic in terms of spirituality in the United States are the people who identify as spiritual, but not religious. Right. You know, and it also, this is something that you refer to with the new age and Gnosticism is they're both kind of traditions of anti-tradition. Absolutely. And they're not directly connected. I, 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 I always have to rush to point that out. They're, they're, they're parallel movements separated by millennia, and they're not connected. But you right. do find parallel insights across yeah. vast stretches of time or parallel cultural styles. And, and, and the extent to which the, the Gnostic movement in antiquity sought transcendence without necessarily throwing its lot in with um, early Christianity strictly defined, with Judaism strictly defined, with the ancient and, and at that time fading uh, nature traditions, so-called pagan traditions strictly defined, it created those who we today call Gnostic created a kind of syncretic system, which has something in common uh, with 20th and 21st century New Age as well. It's a syncretic system for non-belongers. Yeah. And uh, what about with Gnosticism? Uh, I think that there are some connections as well with Hermeticism. And that seems yep. to be more at play, although you do write that um, Hermeticism is not the foundation for New Age thought, um, right. but it seems to be applicable to it. And so I was curious yes. if you could uh, discuss that a little bit. Sure. It's another area where one finds parallel insights that are not directly connected by any family tree of ideas. Um, history is very messy, does not run along straight lines. There are very, very few historical retentions from antiquity that have not undergone periods of great interruption, uh, periods of discontinuity, readaptations. So what we call Hermeticism, as we know it in the West, really goes back in great measure, in great measure, to the Renaissance period where some of the early Hermetic texts uh, began to get translated from Greek into Latin, which was the language of educated folk in the day, and then later from Latin into English and, and other, other languages. And what one finds um, within transcendentalism, within new thought, within certain other modern mystical expressions are points of commonality with Hermeticism. One of the basic outlooks of the Hermetic worldview, which was a worldview that grew out of an encounter between late ancient Greek and Egyptian culture, is the notion that all of reality emanates from uh, nous, or a Greek term for what might be called a higher mind or an infinite mind. That point of view sits incredibly well with transcendentalism and with new thought. And it's interesting because 
you you had a lot of the progenitors of New Thought, for example, in the uh, late 19th century, mostly but not entirely in the U.S., who grew up in very rural situations, who grew up in households where there might have been just a handful of books, the King James Bible, maybe a few other basic religious texts or books on manners and morals, and they arrived at their perspective to a great extent through self-experiment, and they might have been adopting ideas from mesmerism or from other occult traditions, but they were experimenting on their own in pretty rural, mostly agricultural, self-contained circumstances. And the fact that they came up with certain language that had a poignancy and, a, uh, and points of intersection with language and points that were used millennia earlier by people whose writings may not have even reached these folk in translation in English, um, I think that's important. I think that is the scent trail of something very important. I look for parallel insights across great stretches of time, geography, language, custom. When you find them, they can be a scent trail, it seems to me, of some kind of basic truth of the human situation. Uh, so in that way, uh, hermeticism vastly predates some of the insights of transcendentalism, new thought, I would say new age, mm -hmm. but without a direct connection. Okay. Uh, one of the things I was curious about in terms of the hermeticism um, is, especially with what you were just talking about, um, like uh, this idea of the noose, uh, the mind, there seems to be a movement now in terms of, at least in philosophy, of rejecting materialism. And I hear more and more people saying, well, maybe consciousness or mind, whatever that may be, may be more what is fundamental. And it seems to me that what might be happening is we're getting a sort of philosophical metaphysic that is actually agreeing with some of the tenets of new age and hermeticism well it, i think that is one of the changes that we're witnessing in in this present generation uh the founders of quantum mechanics going back to the 1920s we'll say uh and some earlier some a little later were all i think to a person uh philosophical idealists in that they believed that reality was perceptual in nature they might have had arguments over the greater or lesser degree of that but they all believed very deeply in the perceptual basis of reality and some like max planck were were very explicit about this and this is world-class science today in the 21st century, and its founders not very long ago uh, were people who specifically identified with a perceptual basis for reality, which runs very counter to philosophical materialism, which basically holds that matter is, is self-created from chemical and biologic uh, processes. Uh, anything that we call thought or psyche or intellect is an epiphenomena of, of the brain, and it's a mechanical uh, function uh, that that occurs within uh, a framework largely of Newtonian physics, and we may gather a data that punches exceptions in that perimeter, but the implications are not taken very seriously, the implications are not followed. Uh, to the extent that a materialistic interpretation of life is seen as the dominant overlaw of, mm -hmm. of human existence. And within academia, within journalism, within a, a good deal of mainstream media, uh, that perspective continues to hold sway and will hold sway for a long time. Uh, the argument will be, well, you know, something like ESP isn't real because ESP can't be real, you know, because right. it's impossible. It is viewed as a, a, a kind of philosophy of the absolutism of common observation, the absolutism right. of common observation. And if you talk to uh, most people, I think, who are part of mainstream outlets of opinion or mainstream uh, academia, with great exceptions, of course, 
but most. Um, the notion that extra physicality is possible is as ridiculous to them as uh, the notion that the moon is made of cheese or that the earth is flat. It's not considered even a, a, a worthy point of debate. And yet the data has built and built and built to the point where you encounter articles routinely in Scientific American where uh, researchers and physicists will provide descriptions of quantum mechanics that make what I say seem conservative. And I don't mean that in a glib way. I mean it in quite a literal way. And I, I try to provide uh, source notes uh, uh, in, 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 a, in my pieces wherever it's pertinent so that people can follow these things and determine for themselves whether I'm exaggerating. I welcome the scrutiny. Um, you can't have any realistic discussion nowadays of the manner in which matter functions without dealing with um, the so-called many worlds theory, uh, bends in space-time, the uh, conceptual nature of linear time and linearity, and the manner in which uh, perception uh, plays a, 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 a critical role to everything that's observed not only on the quantum scale, but in other fields of study as well. I've mentioned too, neuroplasticity, placebo studies. And, and then of course, there's the academic field of parapsychology or psychical research, which is an academic field that has marshaled statistical evidence as replicable, as bulletproof, and as good and world-class as, as any that we've got. Um, so materialism is probably in its in its final stages of dominance as a philosophy, as an outlook, it's gonna hang on for a long time because its proponents are skilled, uh, capable, and well-established. And they are not going to give up those cultural positions uh, right. or the prestige that accompanies them. Uh, there's a um, very prominent materialist philosopher who I quote in uncertain places who in turn is quoting from the comic strip Dilbert, the source of all mm -hmm. wisdom, where we are described as, uh, human beings are described as moist robots. We're nothing mm -hmm. but moist robots. Well, that's preposterous. The field yeah. of neuroplasticity alone, which is not a controversial field, gives lie to that by demonstrating through brain scans how the thoughts, whatever those are, of these moist robots um, actually alter the physical apparatus that makes up these robots, in this case, our mm -hmm. brains. So this stuff is just word games and word yeah. games work really well. Uh, well, yeah. you know, well we, we need only, you know, look at our politics to make that determination mm -hmm. and word games can gain you a lot of power and, and you can keep mm -hmm. that power for a long, long time. Um, so materialism ain't going to go gently. You know, we're not going to wake right. up tomorrow and suddenly the materialist equivalent of the Berlin Wall has come down. I doubt strongly that's ever yeah. going to happen. But there is a change underfoot. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, it's one of the things that I always think of here is in terms of, and I'm using this in the way I think that it was originally intended with uh, Thomas Kuhn. Uh, in the structures of scientific revolutions in terms of paradigms. Yes. And I think that we are undergoing a sort of paradigm shift, but like you mm -hmm. said, it's not going to happen overnight. <clears throat> right. And I see just from my perspective, you know, I, I teach uh, religious studies and I teach philosophy and some of the classes that I teach, I was just speaking with my students about this last night uh, because I'm a bit of a heretic in the classroom. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, some of the classes I teach on a regular basis are logic and critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And there's always a section on pseudoscience. And in the books, and I've got them, I can even show them to you, where it talks about things, you know, like ESP, and it just says, there's just no evidence for it. Right. And I know enough to know that there is. And I reached the conclusion pretty early on that these textbooks, these were just indoctrinations into a thought system, that yeah. they weren't actually teaching what they were supposed to be teaching, which is critical thinking and logic, but they're teaching indoctrination, and that is not critical thinking. Yeah, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, the um, 
uh, the skeptic, I would say uh, pseudo skeptic, maybe you could call him professional skeptic, James Randi died about two years ago. And I wrote a piece about him called The Man Who Destroyed Skepticism, which is reprinted mm -hmm. in uncertain places. I was extremely critical and I had my reasons. And this yeah. is one of them. Um, James, uh, before his death, created an online teacher's guide for grade school teachers um, to teach kids about uh, ESP research. So if an eighth grader, uh, 12th grader comes up and asks his teacher about ESP research, they can go to James's guide. And James states in his guide that J.B. Ryan, the founder of the parapsychology lab at Duke University in the 1930s, and probably the man who established parapsychology as an academic field here in the United States, um, excluded from his famous ESP experiments with Zener cards, uh, negative sets. So sets that didn't conform to um, uh, some sort of like above chance hit rate were excluded. Not only is that blatantly not true, but JP, in fact, led the whole field of the social sciences in general, not just parapsychology, but the social sciences in general of reversing what at that time in the 30s had been a very, very unfortunate and poor practice on the part of many social scientists of excluding a negative sets. And JP and his colleagues at the Duke Parapsychology Lab pioneered the first modern meta-analysis of statistical mm -hmm. studies in 1940 in a book called ESP Research After 60 Years. Uh, JP is a widely uh, credited, uh, even on Wikipedia as we speak, this may change, I should be saying this in a whisper, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, JB is is widely credited, including on Wiki, um, which has uh, uh, been the victim of a lot of crowdsourcing from um, what I would describe as polemical skeptics, pseudo-skeptics who are determined to amplify the uh, things you're coming across in these textbooks on on this reference source, and they're very successful. Um, J, JB is credited as having performed the first meta-analysis. Uh, he is widely credited with including every set uh, of reversing that very unfortunate practice that, that was widespread in the social sciences in general. And uh, James knew this. James knew this. And uh, I'm going to use a strong word, and it's not a word I like using, but James lied. And to not use that word would be to do an injustice to the language. Um, and this is out there online, misinforming, uh, purposefully misinforming grade school teachers. Now, I reach the limits of my understanding of human nature as to the um, motives to do something like that. But what I can say is that when a journalist or when a casual onlooker puts ESP uh, into his Google search window, uh, the first five results that come up are going to echo things like this. And hence, you get statements now in textbooks and for some time in textbooks referring to ESP studies or parapsychology as pseudoscience. And it's, it's rendered the term pseudoscience almost meaningful uh, meaningless uh, in itself. Um, mm -hmm. If we're going to apply the term pseudoscience in that way, then that term has just turned into a polemical device and not an actual definition. Um, I don't know what to do about that state of affairs. I, I certainly work hard to document the history. In my book, Daydream Believer, I have a very long chapter on uh, parapsychology. I have two articles I've recently published one is called Is Precognition Real? The other is called The Enduring Legacy of Parapsychologist J.B. Ryan. They're filled with footnotes and references. Um, they're factual. Uh, they're ethically argued. They appeared on Boing Boing, still a reasonably popular site. And people who want them find their way to them. But um, as far as uh, combating um, disinformation, uh, on a large scale, uh, people like me who care about these topics uh, have lost. Uh, we have lost that that battle. I don't have time to sit around trying to undo the bugs in Wikipedia pages. And if I did, it wouldn't matter because there's a very well-organized coterie of, I would say, polemical, uninformed, and in some cases, pseudo-skeptics who will go back and change it faster than I I can possibly pay attention to it and I have other things to be doing. So um, 
in terms of the battle for popular reference material and many textbooks, um, we've lost. We've lost. That state of affairs may change. Things can change. Uh, we've seen the mainstreaming of the UFO thesis. Uh, um, reporters uh, Ralph Blumenthal, Helene Cooper, and Leslie Keen uh, began reporting on some of these Navy cockpit videos of uh, UFOs starting in 2017. That coverage has uh, continued. Uh, that coverage has spilled over into some other influential places like the New Yorker, which I think uh, has generally uh, of late done a pretty good job on these topics. So things can change, but 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 they don't change by sticking our heads in the sand. The problem right. that you're identifying, uh, it's real, it's dominant, and it's the state that we live in. Yeah. Well, and it seems like we need to have more heretics in the classrooms who challenge these things. And I, I see it a little bit in some of um, uh, academia, uh, like, for example, in the work with uh, Jeffrey Kripal. Yep. Um, I think, you know, he says, look, we need to start taking these things seriously as at least, you know, phenomena, <laughs> subjective experiences and to examine them um, yep. because not doing so is doing a disservice to what it means to be a human, I think. Yeah, it's a disservice to the search. It's a disservice to the question of what's around the next corner. Mm -hmm. And um, Jeff has assembled at Rice a, an incredible coterie of scholars who are willing to probe these questions. And Jeff is also an extraordinary communicator, as was J.B. Ryan, for that matter. So in that sense, Jeff is such an important figure uh, within the scholarly culture to, to open up these questions. And there are a few others, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. But Jeff is a uniquely gifted skillful and ethical communicator and that's important too yeah it, well it also helps to have tenure before doing these things <laughs> it sure does <laughs> it sure does and uh you know uh we've seen the problems that can cause and and in jeff's case we see the benefits of tenure and what it was really intended to accomplish yeah yeah for sure um so i want to kind of backtrack a little bit um to the new thought and kind of uh, sticking with this sort of philosophical foundation uh, with uh, new age. One of the issues that I used to have with uh, when it was more popularly known as the law of attraction, when the secret came out. Um, and I know that it really spoke to people. I had students coming up all the time saying, can I do that? Can I do a paper on this? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, but one of the issues I always had was the one that you talk about, and you say that we need a theology of suffering. And that was always my concern with it, because sometimes it felt like it was blaming the victim. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't seem to take into account that some people are just born in poverty uh, yes. and uh, other, you know, sort of detrimental situations. Uh, so I know you write about this, but I wanted to ask you about it. Um, uh, and so that we can tease the audience a little bit so that uh, they can go out and buy your book. Uh, uh, but how, how do you account for this? How do you account for this lack of a theology of suffering and new thought? Well, when New Thought uh, took shape in the late 19th century, the notion, it was really a philosophy and remains a philosophy of extreme idealism, that perception is everything. And I've always had a problem with that because it doesn't square with my experience. And look, experience is the one form of empiricism that we have in the search, at least as far as the individual is concerned. And this and 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 for that reason i i i do not use the term law of attraction even though i do not run away from some of these terms cuz I, I i do feel some of them have historical integrity and i want to keep them but law of attraction uh which has traced a very winding path in our culture and began in the 1850s as a very different kind of term. It was almost an adaptation of some ideas from 
Emanuel Swedenborg. Colloquially, mm -hmm. as it came into use, it came to denote an overarching mental super law. And mm -hmm. while consciousness may be the ultimate arbiter of reality, and I think that's a, a an important query, we experience many different laws and forces, many different laws and forces, including bodily decline, including mortality, including mass. Kick a rock and you will feel pain, except for, you know, just extraordinary circumstances. Yeah. And there may be uh, certain yogis or mystics who are able to defy that, but that's not going to be me on Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m., we experience many different laws and forces. And this is an area where I received uh, a helping hand from hermeticism. Mm. As I began to go back to and immerse myself in the surviving texts of hermeticism, and some of them have reached, some of uh, those texts have reached us also along a, a, a rough and jagged path, going through many different stages of being written down by other people, manuscripts being copies of copies of copies, things getting lost, things being disorganized, fragments coming down to us. Antiquity was really messy. Um, and, and stuff that came out of antiquity that has reached us in many cases, uh, reached us in fragmentary form that got sewn back together. And Hermeticism is no exception to that. But what we do have does present a, a certain degree of cohesion. And one of the tenets of hermetic philosophy was that this infinite mind, nous, creates via intellect. And these figments of intellect pass through several different uh, concentric circles of reality, one of which we occupy. And the circle of reality that we occupy, the cosmology that we occupy, is, to put it in a certain way, disadvantageous. We are not at the center of things. We are very far and very distant from nous, and we live under many laws and forces, some of which may lighten, some of which may lift as the individual undergoes processes of development or passes through different recurrences, and maybe gets closer to that source of emanation, that source of creation. But the place that we occupy is a place where we must function within a very strict physical framework. That doesn't mean the mind is bereft of causative properties, as above, so below. The mind possesses creative properties as it was created. But as the Book of Psalms says, and probably in its most hermetic passage, if I can put it that way, ye are as gods, ye shall die as princes, or ye shall die as men. That's the, the friction, the contradiction, the, the, the malady of our existence. We have these abilities that seem to echo those of creation, and yet we also have to function under laws that can be very uh, restrictive and and subject us to suffering and tragedy and catastrophe. New thought has never done a good job of even acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. And that's the chief problem that I have with it. I love that philosophy because I think that that popular philosophy had a really wonderful instinct for the greater dimensions of human nature. And I value it. And I value some of the classic literature that comes out of that philosophy. I participate in reintroducing it, repackaging it. I'm involved in it. I care about it. But New Thought always did a better job of popularizing than of refining itself. Mm -hmm. And if it's going to be meaningful as a philosophy to sensitive individuals, um, it's going to have to contend with the catastrophes of life in a way that might require its expansion that doesn't necessarily rely strictly upon no nope, mental super law that's everything that's all there is and if it doesn't work for you try it again you know which is really the approach within new thought well you're doing it wrong you know and yeah. that's where you start to get in some of this victim blaming stuff and that's serious uh so i think new thought requires some real maturing 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because, you know, I, not just on the individual, but I would often think about the collective experience of people. And how do you account for that? Um, I think the first time that I personally came into contact with some of these ideas was in uh, some of the Seth books by Jane Roberts. And Seth kind of does the same thing. You know, there it's, you know, you create your own reality. Yeah. Um, and I, one of my first thoughts when I was reading him when I was 18, I'm like, well, what about people who live someplace and there's a massive earthquake? Did Absolutely. they create that? Right. Of course. Right. I mean, that's a perfect example. We live under these seismic forces, weather patterns. And even if the law of mind causation is correct, if that's a natural law, well, every natural law is mitigated by circumstance. Your gravity is a natural law, but you experience it differently here on Earth than you would on the moon or on Jupiter. Water is always water, H2O, but it can be a vapor, it can be a liquid, it can be a solid, depending on temperature. So why would a law of mind be different? And I think right. new thought should be acknowledging of that. Yeah. So it seems like what we need to do is start <clears throat> experimenting. Exactly. Exactly. And that's really what I'm I'm all about. You know, my right. hope is that books like Daydream Believer and uh, Uncertain Places are an invitation to experiment. Experiment is very important. You know, uh, uh, um, what an individual experiences matters. Uh, people within the hard core materialist world would say, oh, you know, that's just anecdote. Well, mm. I would call it testimony. The difference between yeah. anecdote and testimony usually lies in human sympathies for right. what's being tried. And if something over a course of time produces a, a body of testimonial experiences, well, that becomes a record. And we use that all the time. We use that in therapy, for example. Mm. So um, I think that's very valid. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of questions that have to be addressed because I think there's something there. And one of the things that I was thinking of when I was reading Uncertain Places, or maybe it was when I finished reading it, uh, because you know I had so many ideas that you kind of you know, woke up there, um, was there seems to be this focus in our world on awakening and enlightenment and i see that connected to certainty mm -hmm. you know because and we see that language you know kind of to go back to the conspiracy theories for a moment you know that's the language people will use you know if you don't buy into the q or something they'll say wake up you know right, i know right, this. right right and that's not something <laughs> that you use in you're writing. You don't make these appeals. Instead, what seems to be, and please correct me if I'm wrong, what seems to be sort of the end goal is that sort of creativity. Yeah. Yeah. Shaping a life, self-expression, broadly defined. You know, that to me is, is the point. That's what we're doing here. If we take seriously the scriptural statement, God created man in his own image, or the hermetic mm -hmm. statement, um, as above, so below, which in many ways are at the foundation of the whole Abrahamic religious culture, then it seems to me that the individual's capacity to create, broadly defined, mm. uh, um, <clears throat> is innate to what we're aiming to accomplish with these, these lives. It's what we're given. And the deterrence of self-expression, I think, causes people terrible anguish, sends people to the bottle, sends people into addiction, sends people into spirals of depression or low-grade anxiety that dogged them their whole lives. I've been there. I've felt it myself. Mm -hmm. I'm much happier today, frankly, at, I'm turning 57 this month. I'm much happier today than I was 10, 20 years ago, much happier than I was as a teenager. And friends say to me, oh, I'm bummed about getting older. And I said, well, you know, the clock does run down. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, there is an expiration date out there somewhere. And and yet, <clears throat> I'm certainly happier today than I was. Uh, I attribute that to several things, but one of the things is the capacity for being able to engage in self-expression. Again, broadly defined. It's mm -hmm. going to mean different things to different people based on their circumstances and wishes. But talk of enlightenment, awakening, I think that's far too ennobling of the yeah. human condition. I mean, we have such barriers facing us. Mm -hmm. and the 
the barriers that face us, the emotional conflicts, the circumstantial difficulties are such that I really stay away from those terms. Yeah. And I've never seen examples of those terms coming to fruition. Uh, I have a friend who <clears throat> runs a, um, a, a, a an Aikido studio, the Japanese martial art uh, here in Brooklyn where I live. And, and um, Aikido intersects pretty heavily with the uh, Zen Buddhist culture. And he studied at uh, dojos in Japan and really made a very, very deep immersion into these schools. And I said to him, listen, um, you've been doing this for a long time now. Um, you've spent time in Japan. You've spent time in different facets of the martial arts culture. Have you ever encountered somebody that you would call realized? And he said, no, no, mm -hmm. never. A lot of remarkable people, but nobody who was free from the pettiness, the conflicts, the jealousies, the stupidities, the emotional outbursts mm -hmm. that characterize life. And I think we make, you know, it's weird. I mean, on, on one hand, we make too little an estimation of ourselves because we don't take into account, I think, the higher dimensions of human nature, the greater dimensions of human nature, I would say. On another hand, I think that, and this is a malady of the new age, we also rush to make these wonderful assessments of ourselves just based on experiences. And I don't really dig when people talk to me about experiences. It's almost like showing you their vacation photos. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, big deal. You know, you you went to India and, you know, you visited these different ashrams, but are you there right now? Can you summon right now what you were experiencing then? It's like, you know, we collect experiences and, and we think there's a permanency to them. And I've never seen evidence of that. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. And so that's where I think the uncertainty is so important. But the other thing is, it's a quote from Thoreau in Walden. Um, hopefully, I won't mangle this too much. But I think the direct quote is something like, I have never met a man who was fully awake. If I had, how could I look him in the face? Yeah, that's wonderfully put. Wonderfully put. I would fall to my knees and beg such a person to become my teacher, you know? Yeah. And so those words, I think, are just too inflated. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that this is something that's also really important in New Age is to, I mean, and outside of New Age as well, is to avoid that sort of ego inflation. Yeah. You know, we need to learn how to maybe be a little bit more humble <laughs> in our approach to spirituality, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, I spent many years within the Gurdjieff work, and that was very helpful to me because the Gurdjieff work in its traditional iterations in group settings puts you into situations that are unfamiliar and that are difficult. And when you find yourself, when I find myself awakened at an inconvenient hour in a cold place and asked to perform an unfamiliar task, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. And and it's very emotional, and it's physically difficult, and you come face to face with yourself in a way that can be very, very helpful. Uh, I used to work in corporate publishing, and I would see mm -hmm. people, you know, who would go strutting up and down the halls in their fancy pantsuits and other things, and I thought to myself, strut all you want, but if you were, you know, on a lonely road somewhere and got a flat tire and didn't have cell service, and night was falling, and snow flurries started coming down, would you have any idea what to do? And that's not a very tough situation. That's not being in the civil war in Syria or Yemen or having bombs falling on you in Ukraine. Uh, that's not being a victim of gang violence in Haiti. I mean, these are ghastly, ghastly, horrible situations. You just have a flat tire on the side of a lonely road. Most people couldn't even function in that situation. And that that's something that we ought to keep dead square in front of us at all times yeah yeah for sure so um this is also in, in terms of um uh, uh the, the, the humility and what we were just talking about one of the themes uh, and this may seem a little contradictory but i think uh, i don't think it is but one of the themes that seems to run through these essays is the theme of power mm -hmm. 
but it, it's not a power mm-hmm. over. Uh, and I think you're very clear mm-hmm. about that. Um, and is the power, the, uh, that generative, that creative aspect, or uh, do you mean something different uh, when you write about power? I, I do see it as that generative, that creative aspect, the capacity, the agency to see through some form of establishment of, of how one wants to structure one's selfhood, surroundings, relationships. That That's the power to, that I reference. And I think most people are embarked on the spiritual path for power. Uh, they say, of course, truth, understanding, enlightenment, service. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but very frequently, uh, and 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 sometimes in a very self-alienated way, um, the aim is power. We're seeking invisible help. We're seeking some relation with greater forces that can abet us in this in this effort. Um, if I I call I use the term spirituality all the time, by which I simply mean extra physicality. If extra physical properties are part of our lives, which I think they indisputably are, then it stands to reason that those properties, along with cognition, along with motor skills, uh, aid and abet us in the establishment of self, which is what I define as power. Yeah. Yeah. And when I, th- I just found it so interesting <laughs> that you identify the spiritual search as the search for power, yes. because that is something that I don't think most people think about. And I think maybe they may rub against it a little bit for sure i mean that really rubs some people the wrong way you know they would say you've got it all wrong buddy you know the spiritual Mm -hmm. search is the search for it's the search for truth it's the search for awareness it's the search for um the 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 numinous a sense of the human whole and i i can only draw upon my own experience as a seeker and believe that my experience is not exceptional to my life alone i find and i've been doing this for a long time and i find in my own experience and in the experience of those with whom i've collaborated on the path uh, people are embarked on the spiritual search or the religious search or what have you because they are invested in selfhood in trying Mm -hmm. to find out who am i what am i doing here what am i supposed to be doing they we many of us feel uncomfortable in our own skin we we Uh, As I was alluding earlier, we go through life with this sense of uh, ruptured relationships, addiction problems, um, low-grade depression, uh, anxiety, a persistent feeling of a kind of a dread, uh, a a great discomfort and feeling very boxed in. And to find our way out of that box, we sometimes pursue therapy, we sometimes pursue philosophy. We sometimes pursue any number of physical activities. We very often pursue um, the spiritual path, the extra physical path. And I think that the establishment of self to a very great degree is what we're looking for. And and we've been rendered afraid of expressing that and feeling the need to perfume it or reprocess it in some way because of the language that's been handed down to us. But it falls within the the rights of the seeker. And I would say it, it, it's the prerogative of the seeker, the need of the seeker to self-verify in matters of, of personal philosophy, uh, ethics, religion. I think verification is, is absolutely critical. It's the search itself. So we can't always defer to language frameworks, concepts that have been handed down to us and that seem overwhelmingly true by dint of familiarity it can create a very narrow corridor okay so you just mentioned a word that i wanted to ask you about um in terms of again new age um you know we we're, we we've looked at like the metaphysics and a little bit of the epistemology um what about ethics is there an ethic to new age thought Well, certainly the ethic that I have on the path is one of reciprocity. Uh, I do take seriously the the concept that we all participate Mm -hmm. in a extra physical facet of existence, which suggests a commonality that goes even deeper and further than the ecosphere within which we function. 
And it stands to reason that my actions affect another individual in a dramatic series of ways and, 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 and vice versa. And so reciprocity or what might be called karma, um, a word that I, I don't use too much because I'm, I'm not trying to kind of cherry pick from other traditions. I mean, karma is a very vast concept that, that, that doesn't just play out so clearly as the law of cause and effect on intimate circumstances. I mean, the Vedic concept of karma is enormous. But I do believe on a more intimate scale, one can speak of reciprocity, and that is my ethic. And invariably, if I'm doing something that violates another person, I think there is an absolute um, connection that 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 runs dynamically between me and that individual. And that that feedback loop, I think, is basic to life. So um, my talk of power doesn't imply freedom from debts, freedom from obligations, freedom from relationships, which are the very basis of life itself. Uh, to be alive is to be in relationship. And so the ethic of reciprocity is certainly uh, my, my core a principle on the path. Yeah, yeah. So the, the sentence, I actually have this in my notes, uh, power without reciprocity is force. Yes, yeah. 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 I like that. I think that it is so necessary for us to have an ethic based on relationship and not some kind of abstract, you know, rule. I, you know, I, I don't think necessarily that justice is blind. I think for justice to be justice, she has to be able to see. I agree. I agree. And the scales of karma as as that concept is understood within Vedic culture, and there are many different understandings of karma, can be very, very vast. And you find some of this in Nietzsche. Nietzsche has this very haunting passage, I think, in Beyond Good and Evil, where he writes, um, because someone's done harm to you doesn't necessarily mean that the payback uh, has to be directly to that person. And it's a very challenging statement because it mm. seems unfair. You know, are right. you suggesting that, you know, some pedestrian bystander suffers because I've suffered? And Nietzsche would probably uh, retort, well, um, look, uh, if something good happens to you, you're not necessarily able to pay back the good to the party that's responsible, but you're going to pay it back to somebody. Mm. And, you know, these are the kind of impersonal scales of karma that I think resound um, deeply within uh, classical Vedic uh, culture. It's not necessarily, it's not the instant karma that John Lennon right. sang right. about, which I think appeals to all of us because we want to feel like there's some justice in the world. And I think there is, but the scales of karma can be very, very vast. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so um, the, the Power. I want to go back to kind of stick with power here a little bit. Um, is it the same thing as will? Um, because when you were speaking, I was thinking in terms of sort of the magical connotations of power and will and um, having uh, what, what's the definition that Crowley gives of magic of uh, affecting change in the world according to will. Yes, yes. Yeah, will is a term, a true self, true will that, that that Crowley uses and defines magic as you just described. And I would say it comports with that, frankly. I don't use too much of Crowley's terminology right. because although I admire him greatly as an artist, um, as a magician, uh, as a thinker, um, I find him as a person uh, somewhat repellent. Yeah. And uh, in terms of how he treated people in matters of relationship. So probably for that reason, I don't rely too heavily on Crowley's aesthetics, but I think it comports pretty well yeah. with his description of will. Yes. Yeah. Well, and it seems to me that one of the issues is that just in general in the world is that we feel, I think so many people feel so robbed of their power. Yeah. And maybe <clears throat> that's why things have gotten good for you <laughs> over the years, because you're acting out of your power. I think that I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that we are starting to run out of time. 
I'm trying to think if there was anything else I wanted to ask you. Oh, uh, you talked about this um, briefly. I just wanted to run it by you because one of the other themes, uh, and this is the last one that I identified, is you talk about friction mm-hmm. uh, and friction being the human and spiritual situation. And I was wondering if you could just say a few words about that friction. I know you said it a little bit ago, but uh, it escapes me at the moment exactly what you said. Uh, well, but, it, it yeah. plays out on so many different scales, but it seems to me that without the presence of a need, a challenge, a feeling of being thwarted, what would the individual do other than sit around you know, in the Garden of Paradise all day gazing at his or her fig leaf or navel or whatever? Um Need is what engenders creativity. Mm. Um, And William Blake beautifully wrote in Marriage of Heaven and Hell in 1790, opposition is true friendship. Mm. It's really worth living with that that maxim for a long time. Opposition is true friendship. Mm. Um, It is painful to be thwarted. It is painful to be misunderstood. It is painful to have somebody a direct criticism at you that is a a manifest um, misreading of something that you're attempting. And I experience that stuff all the time, as everybody does. I've also never experienced such an instance that didn't somehow serve as a goad uh, to making me better. And the circumstances of my life that were most painful, um, both in in the distant past and, and recently, I can always trace as also having been the ignition point of some clarification in my message and what I'm attempting to do. They hurt, they sting, uh, but they're also medicinal. And Mm -hmm. of course, sometimes friction plays out in ways that it's just overwhelming. And um, this is why Nietzsche famously observed out of life school of war, what doesn't destroy me makes me stronger. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, sometimes we are faced with crushing uh, opposition that that does destroy us. Sometimes these things are just the result of natural circumstances, like the earthquake that you were describing. Mm-hmm. Look, you know, a monsoon hits the Philippines, an earthquake hits Haiti. It's horrible. And, and it's unjust because there's you know, we can't stop any of these things, but we we can have architecture and electrical systems and early warning systems that will save lives, but these things are deemed too expensive. So uh, the lives are deemed cheaper than the money and the tech that would help people in these situations. There's terrible injustice, you know, so sometimes friction, of course, does overwhelm the individual, but when it doesn't, uh, Nietzsche's quote uh, has something very valuable and he makes allowances for that. Yeah. And so with this friction, it seems like one of the things that we need to do to mm-hmm. kind of take it back to the new thought is to try our damnedest to have a positive or beneficial attitude to move forward to meet these challenges. Although this is one place where I find it personally difficult sometimes, um, because sometimes the challenges are quite a bit. Um, yeah, and, um, absolutely. Absolutely. I describe faith as persistence. I've always had it tough coming up with a definition of what faith means exactly. I define it as persistence, and I define a positive attitude as an attitude that strives to evaluate events based on their capacity for self-development. And that can take a long time, and that can be a very fitful path filled with switchbacks. Um, because we don't want friction. We don't want to to suffer being thwarted, being horribly inconvenienced or failing or not being recognized, whatever. Um, but but I do think that the viewing circ- attempting to view circumstances, um, to value circumstances based on their capacity for self-development um, is is a, is a it's my definition at least of a positive mental attitude. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that one of the things that holds people back often is fear. Um, And that for the most part, people I know that have taken the risks have succeeded. Yes. A statistician once put it to me this way, life favors action. He felt if you crunch the numbers, you'll find that people are more likely to get out of a bad circumstance yeah. if they act, you know, rather than freeze. It's an observation William yeah. James made as well. 
So, you know, people talk about having problems with procrastination, for example. Mm -hmm. Procrastination is fear. It's just a pretty word that we give to fear. If you need to study and you're not studying and you say, oh, I'm procrastinating. Well, you know, there's one of two things going on. You're either afraid or you're just in the wrong field of study. I mean, you don't have to pursue this or that degree. If you really don't want to study, then you should probably be doing something else, you know, and, yeah. and, 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 and we call it procrastination, but I think in many regards, it's fear. Yeah. Fear is the mind killer, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> fear is a mind Real. killer. All right. Well, Mitch, I, I, I am so grateful for the time that you gave me today and Thank you. I Enjoy thoroughly it. enjoyed the conversation. Um, let me ask you before I let you go, what's next for you? Uh, uh Sure. I'm, I'm writing a book right now called Modern Occultism, which is a history of the occult from uh, basically late antiquity up through the present. And it's an epic undertaking. I'm enjoying it immensely. I have no uh, plans to get adequate sleep anytime soon. Uh, and that's going to be out next summer. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I, one of the questions that's in the back of my mind, Mike, how does this man do this? You have so many books. <laughs> and, um, well, it's impressive. It's very impressive. Thank you. I appreciate it. Passion uh, mm -hmm. is a big part of it. And I always point out to people, I didn't publish my first book, Occult America, until I was age 43 going on 44. Mm -hmm. And this month I'm turning 57. And so because I came to it, you know, what might be considered a little later in life, I never take a day for granted, never yeah. a day for granted. And I think that helps too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's something I try to practice. Uh, what was it? Castaneda said to have death as your ally. Yeah, uh, always exactly. Kind of keep that in the background, right? It's a wonderful expression of his. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, Mitch, thank you again so much. I really appreciated your time and this thank conversation. You. And thank you. I want to thank you for creating this kind of discussion space. I, I just found this uh, discussion enormously fortifying and gratifying. It gave me a lot of energy. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I'll have to have you back when the uh, next book is published. Be delighted. Um, and uh, hopefully one of these days I'll be able to make it to the Philosophical Research Society when you're in town. That'd be swell. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. And that's a wrap on episode 62 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience or view this on Spotify. Before anything else, I'd like to give a special shout out to David Wood for being the first person to make a donation to Rebel Spirit Radio. I know I already did this once, but, you know, I really am grateful for David's generosity, which was very much appreciated. And as promised, David, you have my undying gratitude. For anyone else who would like to contribute to this podcast, I have officially launched a Patreon. There are currently four levels of membership, Seeker, Sage, Adept, and Guru. Some of the perks available include early access to videos, shout outs to members, a members only Facebook page, access to the Rebel Spirit Radio Discourse server, a monthly book club, and the opportunity to join me and special guests for a monthly cocktail apocalypse, happy hour at the end of the world. You can find the link for the Patreon in the show notes or video description. And of course, if you'd still like to make a one-time donation, you can still do so via PayPal. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. It only takes a second and your five-star ratings really do help, especially if you listen on Apple. If you have a moment to spare, please consider posting a short but positive review. And please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit. <laughs>